Chapter Eight of the Barnabys in America by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight. Miss Matilda suffers a good deal from sundry difficulties in dressing herself, but finds consolation in conscious grace. Mrs. Carmichael's boarders introduced by name and by fame. Conversation among the ladies. The soul of Mister Allen Barnaby is awakened to new objects and new hopes at five o'clock precisely an immense dinner-bell sent its startling sound through every apartment of mrs carmichael's establishment but lest the uninitiated strangers might not immediately be aware what the sound meant a brace of negro girls was sent by the attentive hostess to tell them that everybody was done finished dressing and go down to dinner this notice came in welcome time to everybody except miss matilda but she poor dear young lady had failed in no less than three different headdresses which she had attempted to arrange with a peculiarly novel effect and having listened unmoved to her sister's repeated entreaties to make haste and not to mind just the first day and so forth she was at length obliged to tear herself from her looking-glass at the bidding of black jessie with half her lank ringlets tucked back because they would not curl after being so long trifled with in the fervid atmosphere of mrs carmichael's west room she was however comforted with the consciousness that her dress sat like wax and that her tight sleeves made her look uncommonly young with such elasticity of step as this dear thought sufficed to give her she preceded her quiet sister downstairs being ushered into the dining-room by jessie just as about eighteen ladies and gentlemen with mrs carmichael at their head had taken their places at the table some little bustle followed this tardy entrance but this over the business of the hour began a business which in every party varies according to the individual character of those who compose it some as usual thought most of the nature of what was put upon the table to eat and others of the nature of those who sat round the table to eat it eight out of the twelve of mrs carmichael's previous boarders were gentlemen a preponderance highly agreeable to most of the newcomers don or monsieur tornorino as mrs carmichael called him cared not a straw about the matter nor would miss louisa have paid more attention to it than he did had it not been that she knew her poor dear matilda would be pleased a conviction which rendered her pleased too mrs allen barnaby always confessed that on the whole she greatly preferred the society of gentlemen to that of ladies patty in this appeared likely through life to follow her mamma's example the major had almost given up looking at ladies at all even to discover whether they were young or old handsome or ugly so perfectly was he aware that little or no profit could be made of them and as for our fair matilda her feelings on the occasion may surely be left to the sagacity of the reader to discover major allen barnaby gentlemen said mrs carmichael with a sort of circular bow to the table and monsieur tornorino his son-in-law this by all the laws of new orleans elegance was a proper and sufficient introduction of the whole party and as such it was received for as the dinner proceeded the new guests whether male or female were occasionally addressed without reserve by the former ones of those former ones two ladies and two gentlemen were newly married couples beginning their married lives by indulging in a spell of boarding the domestic indolence which it permits rendering it in all parts of the union a very favourite portion of human life but more especially so in the south where every exertion is considered as a positive evil these two exceedingly happy couples were known respectively by the names of mr and mrs anastasius grimes and mr and mrs theodore hucks the two other ladies were a mrs and miss beauchamp and one of the other gentlemen a colonel beauchamp the husband of the former and the father of the latter lady mrs beauchamp in any other country than the united states might still have been considered as young for she was still remarkably handsome and wanted three years of forty her daughter a young thing of scarcely seventeen was as beautiful a girl as it was well possible for the eye to look upon yet all lovely as she was it was probable that she would in a year or two be more lovely still for her graceful form was almost too slight and elancée for feminine perfection of outline but her dark eye already sparkled with intelligence that looked as if the spirit were of a greater maturity than the fair shrine it inhabited she was seated between her father and mother who seemed to vie with each other in noting everything she did and everything she said then there were two elderly gentlemen who soon contrived to make it known to the strangers that they were members of congress a younger man by name horatio timshackle who hinted at literary occupations and another younger still mr washington tomkins who seemed the man of fashion par excellence of the party for he was more gaily dressed and gave himself incomparably more airs than any one else lastly there was an englishman also a young man 
but he gave himself no airs and was in no way remarkably dressed but being seated immediately opposite the beautiful miss beauchamp appeared to find more amusement in watching her tricks than in exhibiting any of his own and in truth this remarkable young lady afforded him sufficient observation in this way for her lively mobility equalled her beauty whether she ate any dinner at all might have been doubtful at the conclusion of the repast even to an accurate observer for it was very difficult to note anything save the expression of her most beauteous face which recorded a rapid succession of observations on every one present for the most part however these appeared not to be in the quizzing line but to be made up of quick remark and a sort of meditative interpretation which seemed again and again to be the consequence of it her dress was as much out of the common way as herself being composed of the smooth shining linen cloth of which children's pinafores are made but it was delicately fine and more of an iron grey than of the usual yellowish tint at the throat and wrists it was relieved by the plain white collar and cuffs which a boy might have worn but the corsage which was fastened in front by a row of little white sugar-loaf buttons had like rebecca's vest at the tournament of ashby de la zouche its two or three last buttons unfastened and where are the pearls or the diamonds or the rubies or the emeralds which would have struck the eye with such a sense of beauty as did the ivory neck thus displayed the dress was confined round her slender but not wasping like waist by a neatly fitting band of the same material of which it was made and the whole effect was enough to have caused the fashionable dressmaker to hang herself for it proclaimed with an eloquence not to be mistaken that her art was worthless the dark brown silken hair of the beauty appeared to be all of the same length and was gathered into one smoothly twisted mass forming a close rich knot at the back of her beautiful little head madame tornorino was seated at the same side of the table as this annie beauchamp and the young englishman notwithstanding his etude suivie of the fair american features threw a glance from time to time upon his young countrywoman the contrast between them was remarkable and probably did not escape him the conversation at an american dinner-table is never much but the major contrived to find out that the gentleman next to him a colonel wingrove and one of the members of congress was fond of a game of piquet and that mr washington tomkins the young man of fashion who sat opposite was considered as very rich played at billiards and ecarte was trying to get up a horse-race and was ready to bet upon anything and everything so on the whole major allen barnaby thought the party agreeable or at any rate that the party composing it had the power of being so considering the number of persons at table the repast was over in an incredibly short space of time and then all the gentlemen starting up the ladies started up after them the male part of the society strolling off to sundry coffee-houses and the ladies returning to the keeping-room where they amused themselves by drinking lemonade and making conversation the extreme heat of the weather might have induced them to scatter themselves as widely as possible apart for which species of luxury the ample apartment was well suited had it not been that the natural curiosity of the sex as well as of the country induced the american ladies to gather round mrs allen barnaby and her party when by degrees all reserve disappeared and the talk among them flowed as freely as if they had known each other for years the mass of mrs carmichael indeed soon ceased to be of the society for sleep overpowered her and stretched at full length and breadth upon an enormous sofa she presently ceased to betray any symptom of animated existence except heavy snoring you have come over in an unaccountable hot season ladies said mrs beauchamp graciously addressing the whole group it will be wonderful luck if you all keep out of the fever and you all fresh europeans is there any catching fever in the town ma'am demanded miss louisa perkins in a voice of alarm oh my what a funny question returned mrs beauchamp laughing why in summer and autumn time new orleans has always got plenty of fever dear me then i hope the major will not think of staying said mrs allen barnaby a young married woman like my daughter madame tornorino should always be extremely careful of her health oh i don't mind the fever a farthing said patty gaily i'm so glad we've got here for my husband is so delighted with it that certainly shows that he is a gentleman of taste replied mrs beauchamp for new orleans is past doubt one of the finest cities in the known world oh mother i wish i could see some of the cities in the unknown world exclaimed her daughter what the european cities i expect you mean my dear well more unlikely things have happened than that an only daughter ma'am 
perhaps yours is an only daughter too and then you will quite understand me when i say that the only daughter of a gentleman of good standing very seldom sets her longing upon anything without having a good chance of getting it perfectly true ma'am returned mrs barnaby with dignity and feeling madame tornorino is an only daughter and i cannot deny that her father's ample fortune has ever anticipated her every wish so you have fixed your heart upon going to europe have you young lady i said annie oh no i have hardly seen anything in my own beautiful land yet i only thought so returned mrs barnaby from what you said about wishing to see the cities of the unknown world you know do you call europe an unknown world said annie innocently why no my dear certainly not i did not mean that of course but what did you mean where was it you were wishing to go i very seldom mean anything ma'am when i speak replied miss beauchamp i hope our daughters will become well acquainted said mrs beauchamp looking with a good deal of interest at the handsome silks and satins of the english mother and daughter though your young lady is married i can promise her that she will find our annie as smart a person as ever she came across in her life she is quite famed throughout the union already smart again muttered the puzzled patty fixing her eyes on annie's brown to holland dress but notwithstanding the utter contempt which she felt for her claims to smartness she was too sociably disposed to neglect this offered opportunity of improving her acquaintance with a native and drawing a chair close to the sofa on which the young american was seated she began what she intended should be a very intimate conversation i dare say you will be full of envy about my being married won't you but that must not prevent our being capital good friends i dare say you will be married soon how old are you i think mamma can tell you better than i can replied miss beauchamp i have an exceedingly bad memory how very odd cried patty staring at her not know how old you are why if you was not so young and so pretty she added lowering her voice that is if you were like my dear friend there miss matilda perkins i should understand it she is always making mistakes about what age she is but that is all very natural isn't it and patty looked at her poor friend matilda and laughed but annie neither looked laughed nor answered but sat immovably still looking as much like a fool as she could possibly contrive to do poor matilda meanwhile who felt that her american campaign could not possibly begin till she had made some acquaintance with the natives was receiving with the most pleased and zealous attention some little initiatory civilities from mrs grimes and mrs hucks you are direct from london i expect ma'am said mrs grimes yes from london direct ma'am responded miss matilda delighted with the opportunity thus afforded her of putting the stamp of fashion upon everything she did and everything she wore i wish to goodness you had come direct from paris instead said mrs hucks i expect you know ma'am that the people of fashion in the union from maine to georgia i may say don't lay any great stress upon the fashion of london we calculate that we have long ago given the go-by to that old city but paris is something we are all ready and willing to knock under there in the article of taste and the fine arts such as millinery dressmaking and the like we count that england is worn out altogether in that respect which is the reason i expect why folks call it the old country this was a terrible blow to poor matilda nevertheless her spirits rallied again as she recollected how very much nearer paris was to london than new orleans and much more anxious to conciliate than to triumph she gently replied that is just what we all say ourselves we all consider everything in london as exceedingly old-fashioned excepting just what is brought over to us fresh from paris which happens very often you know because of the two places being so near mrs allen barnaby who had overheard the latter part of this conversation here volunteered her valuable assistance to miss matilda and feeling quite as desirous of being considered as an arrival of fashionable importance as her friend could be with a vastly bolder spirit whereby to defend her claim she speedily took the business very effectively into her own hands nothing can be more correct ma'am than your observation respecting the london fashions said she i am sure one might think you were just come from europe to hear you for all you say is exactly as if a london lady was saying it but of course you know ma'am how we manage about these matters when i say we i mean to be understood as speaking of people of first-rate importance and fashion who have been introduced at court you know and all that 
for the common middling kind of gentry really know very little about the matter and are as well contented when they put their vulgar stupid heads into a london-made bonnet as if it had been brought express from paris but we of the upper classes cannot endure anything of the kind couriers arrive in london from paris four times in every day for no other purpose in the world than just to bring over bonnets and dresses you cannot think what a pretty sight it is just after one of these spring vans has arrived to see the unpacking of the cases in the rooms of the fashionable milliners i really do not know anything so elegant and so interesting no ladies however who have not yet been presented at court are ever permitted to present on these occasions it was absolutely necessary you know to make some arrangement and regulation of this kind or the milliners rooms would have been filled with a perfect mob but since this has been finally settled nothing can be more elegant than the company one meets on these occasions really well now that does seem to be a very queer idea to be sure let who will have invented it said mrs beauchamp with a little air of disdain but pray ma'am are gentlemen ever admitted certainly they are replied mrs allen barnaby with dignity such i mean as have been presented at court oh then mr robert owen goes to see the caps and bonnets i expect said annie beauchamp innocently if he is a man of fashion i dare say he does answered the not too well informed mrs allen barnaby the young lady did not reply but closed her eyes as if disposed to sleep the conversation however proceeded between the other ladies who all with the exception of miss louisa seemed anxious to hear what further mrs allen barnaby would say and mrs beauchamp answer it was but a day or two before we quitted london said the former lady that we paid our compliments for the last time this season to her majesty queen victoria and a sweet pretty amiable creature she is i assure you it is a great advantage ma'am especially when one has a younger daughter to bring out to have the privilege of going to court there is nothing in the whole world will stand in the place of that positively nothing i will tell you what my good lady returned mrs beauchamp her handsome eyes looking rather fierce and her complexion considerably heightened i will tell you one thing out of pure cleverness and good nature i expect you won't find it answer coming over american ladies with long stories about going to court because it is the very thing of all creation that we most hate despise and abominate you can't i expect though you do come from the old country you can't be so unaccountable ignorant as to not know that a court is a thing we would no more permit in this country than we would the putting of poison into our bread that the very name of it turns us sick and that all the unfortunate people that god in one of his mysteries permit still to be the pitifying victims of such unnatural and degrading oppression ought never to mention such a thing in the presence of a free citizen any more than they would any other disgraceful or indecent misfortune that unhappily belonged to them mrs allen barnaby was so completely thunderstruck and overpowered by this unexpected burst of eloquence that almost for the first time in her life she felt unable to answer a word it is probable that mrs beauchamp who excepting when her patriotic feelings upon which she particularly prided herself were touched was really a very amiable woman it is highly probable that she not only saw but lamented the very violent effect she had produced she would have scorned and hated herself had she upon hearing a person actually boast of having been at a court without being forced to go there by political necessity like the american ministers she would have scorned hated and belittled herself for ever had she heard this without raising the hallowed voice of freedom to express her sense of its baseness but she did not the least in the world wish to be otherwise than exceedingly polite and genteel in her demeanour to mrs allen barnaby and all other european ladies such were now her secret feelings as she watched the perturbed and puzzled countenance of mrs allen barnaby and had she known then she would very likely have parodied against herself the famous lines perhaps it was right to dissemble your love but why did you kick me downstairs under the influence of feelings such as these mrs beauchamp determined to make it manifest to the strangers that a perfect american female could be as much celebrated and distinguished for her politeness and her literature as for her patriotism and political superiority with this view she at once changed her heroic tone for one of familiar kindness and said 
ah must not let you mrs allen barnaby and these other ladies who have come such a curious long way to see our western wonder of the world i must not let you all fancy that the patriotic warmth of our free notions blind us to all those accomplishments as have nothing to do with the government it is quite the contrary i assure you and i expect that you'll realize this fact before you have been long in the country the great point of all with us is your literature you know which we make a most particular principle of studying and that to our honour be it spoken even now when we are quite availed of the fact that we have for some months past by our native productions gone far beyond anything that ever was printed or written in the old world but this of course can't touch any of us in the manner of a surprise because all philosophical people know that a soil that is close worked up and worn out can't be expected to produce things as fine and as flourishing as new soil there is nobody i expect that will venture to contradict that nowadays but never a bit the less for that we are still ready to extend the hand of patronage to european talent and i'll tell you what ladies there is still notwithstanding the terrible great advance which our authors have lately made before the english there is still one way in which an english gentleman or lady either might put everybody of all countries in the world behind them in the point of fame and that is by writing an out-and-out -out good book of travels upon the united states i calculate that there is nobody bold enough to deny that it is the finest subject in the world and so it would have been no doubt of it if nobody had ever put pen to paper about it but when one thinks of all the lies that have got to be contradicted one must be a fool not to see that such a book might be made as would render the author's name as glorious throughout the union as that of general lafayette himself and as to dollars oh my there would be no end to the dollars as would be made by it mrs allen barnaby through all the various changes and chances of her life must ever have appeared to the reader that she really was namely a woman of very extraordinary acuteness though in general perhaps more of a talker than a listener she felt as she now listened to mrs beauchamp that at the present moment much more was to be gained by acquiring than by giving information and when her first dismay occasioned by mrs beauchamp's patriotic outbreak had subsided she gave her earnest and undivided attention to every syllable she uttered it must elevate the characters of both major allen barnaby and his lady in the mind of my readers when they are told that they were at this period of their lives on much more confidential terms together than at any former time since their union both these excellent persons had their peculiarities and though on many points it was quite impossible that any two people could assimilate better there were others respecting which the major had felt when they first married that they might not perhaps from the difference of their previous habits of life hold precisely the same opinions under this impression he had in many cases entirely concealed some little circumstances which he thought might possibly startle his lady and so managed others as gently to bring before her eyes whatever he wished should become familiar to them and thus by degrees had gradually led her to a degree of independent thinking on most subjects hardly inferior to his own so that now he had really scarcely a thought that he concealed from her and she was quite as well aware that his position was at this time a little critical as he could be himself it was doubtless for this reason that she now listened to mrs beauchamp with such deep attention the major had given her very clearly to understand that their well-doing for the future depended altogether upon their being able to establish themselves in the esteem and good liking of the inhabitants of the land in which they had in fact taken refuge from a good deal that might have made it difficult for them to find an agreeable abode elsewhere every word that her new acquaintance uttered therefore seemed to be big with important meaning and before she had ceased to speak an effect had been produced on the mind of mrs allen barnaby which as she afterwards said in communicating it to the major was likely to have an influence on the whole of her future life when deep impressions are made upon the soul it often appears for a time as if the effect produced were working so strongly within as to prevent any portion of the result from being left visible without and so it was on the present occasion with mrs allen barnaby neither mrs beauchamp herself or any other person present were in the least degree aware of what was going on in the secret recesses of her mind nevertheless she had sufficient command of herself to retain the appearance of being perfectly present to everything that was passing 
when mrs grimes remarked to her that there was no country in the world that enjoyed the luxury of iced water in the same elegant manner as new orleans she bowed and smiled exactly with a proper degree of acquiescence and when mrs hucks holding out her foot for inspection said that she supposed the ladies had heard that american females were famous for their beauty in that particular part of the person any one in the world who had seen her might have supposed that she knew what had been said but in point of fact she had not the slightest idea what the observation meant yet with a sort of instinctive cleverness made a little action with her hand towards miss matilda perkins who was sitting near her as if to refer the matter to her from thinking her a person peculiarly well calculated to discuss it this instantly carried the attention of every american lady present except the sleeping annie towards miss matilda and as that graceful young lady was blessed by having a long slender foot which might have defied the toes of nine-tenths of her female fellow-creatures to get into her shoe though there was stuff enough in one of her long slippers to make a pair for many it answered very well as it brought on a long discussion upon long feet and short feet and broad feet and narrow feet and round feet and square feet all of which sheltered the reverie of mrs allen barnaby from observation and enabled her very satisfactorily to arrange her thoughts before she was called upon by mrs carmichael to decide whether she would take coffee or tea by that time she had sufficiently recovered her usual state of mind to be aware that of all the party which had dined together her own set and the portly lady of the mansion were all that remained in the saloon and it was not without a sensation of envy that she learned they were all gone to various evening parties of which a vast number were nightly given in the town the only gentleman who reappeared was the young englishman mr egerton but having looked round the large half-lighted room in search of some one whom as it appeared he did not find he rambled into the moonlit balcony for a few minutes then passed through the saloon again and disappeared dullness seemed now to settle heavily upon the party mrs carmichael after subjecting miss matilda perkins who chanced to be the one seated next her to the usual transatlantic process of interrogation as to everything about her goings and doings past and future did not appear to consider herself obliged to do the honours of her mansion any further and having caused a female slave to bring in a large square of light green gauze and so to arrange it round her head neck and arms as to protect her from the attacks of mosquitoes she deliberately prepared herself for sleep had mrs allen barnaby therefore been at that moment inclined for conversation which she certainly was not she would not have indulged in it her fixed and steadfast resolution to conciliate every man woman and child in the union being quite sufficient to prevent her running the risk of keeping any of them awake when they wished to sleep so she quietly prepared herself to follow her gigantic hostess's example but she soon found that there were two causes which would render this impossible the first and most important was the absence of the green gauze for no sooner had she lain herself in an attitude of rest than a sharp threatening buzz became audible around her and in the next that irritating paroxysm of feverish unrest supervened which none can conceive or comprehend who have not been exposed to the torment the second cause of prevention to her desired repose was the voice of her daughter who now began in accents less soft than those of the forsaken wood-pigeon first to deplore the cruel absence of her lord and then to predict how he should be treated when she got him again so mrs allen barnaby reared herself up again and looking round her conceived the very rational idea that let the hour be what it might the best thing they could do would be to go to bed for the eldest miss perkins was looking so pale so woebegone that a heart of stone might have felt an interest in getting her deposited where there was the best chance of her forgetting all the thoughts and all the feelings that now seemed to have hold of her while the youngest her hopes all flat had much the aspect of a ghost who waits to be spoken to before he avows his purpose and as to patty she was bemoaning herself so piteously that it was evidently much better she should be alone than in company what do you say my dears you are all going to bed said mrs allen barnaby rising from her recumbent posture and shaking the envenomed host that tormented her from her person there is no good in our waiting for the men for i know of old patty dear that when they once get roaming about a new place it is not a short time that will bring them back again the two miss perkinses rose instantly and might perhaps have looked comforted could the features of either at that moment have taken suddenly so agreeable an expression but patty's reply to the question was almost a scream from the tone in which she uttered what before tornorino comes back what a brute you must be mamma to think of such a thing mrs allen barnaby however admirable mother as she was seldom made up her mind to do one thing because she liked it best herself and then did something else because her daughter liked it better 
and now therefore proceeding to a small table in a corner of the room on which stood several night lamps she took one saying very well my dear you will do as you like just ring the bell louisa will you i can't do without having the black woman to show me the way patty pulled out her pocket handkerchief and actually began to sob but the black woman appeared her mother and the dear perkinses began to move and patty rose and followed them scolding her mother though all the time very heartily how soon the various individuals of the party found consolation for their different sorrows in sleep is not easily known but mrs allen barnaby whose career it is the historian's especial business to follow was soon snugly and contentedly ensconced within her mosquito net and though she had too much to say to her husband not to wish for his presence she nevertheless would not allow herself to regret his absence knowing too well the nature of the city he had selected for his residence not to feel thoroughly persuaded that stranger as he was he must be nevertheless already well employed and as she nestled her head on her pillow she muttered without intending any quotation he is about it end of chapter eight chapters nine and ten of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine conjugal confidence mrs allen barnaby discloses to the major a project upon which he founds brilliant expectations of future fame and fortune he receives the information with his usual amiable temper and fine judgment it was nearly two hours past midnight when major allen barnaby mounted very quietly to his chamber yet not so noiselessly either as to avoid waking his wife the thoughts she wished to communicate to him however were both too important and too voluminous to be opened upon at such an hour and nearly all the words which passed between them were on her side well donny have you done anything and on his yes pretty well but i am devilish tired you shall hear more to-morrow good-night the morrow came and found them both in the best possible humour for conjugal confidence as soon as the fact of their both being wide awake was mutually ascertained mrs allen barnaby resumed the questioning of the preceding night by saying well dear and what did you do why tolerably well for just the first setting off and tornorino is a much better hand than foxcroft i am devilish glad i refused to bring that fellow he is so confounded clumsy he can't give one a look without staring one full in the face but patty's don is quite another style of aide-de-camp though he generally looks you know as if he were half asleep i promise you i found him perfectly wide awake so much so indeed that i asked him how it happened that we found him so confoundedly poor and why he had never tried the sort of thing before and what did he say major demanded his wife rather eagerly he answered with the most perfect frankness that he had never had capital enough since he left spain to attempt the sort of thing at all in the style of a gentleman i really like the young fellow exceedingly i am monstrous glad to hear it replied his wife for patty perfectly dotes upon him so that's all as it should be but now my dear do tell me a little about the style in which you find they do things here do you think it will suit you donny do you think you will find it answer answer repeated the major significantly i dare say enough may be done to repay time and trouble but if by answer you mean anything like the glorious opportunities one had in london in the way we were going on i must certainly say no nothing at all approaching even the sum that fool ronaldson had in his pocket-book is ever likely to be got by one job i'll venture to say without a word about the checks he was willing enough to have given if that confounded jade had not stopped him no nothing of this magnitude my barnaby nothing near it can ever be hoped for but we must make the best of it now my dear and do as well as we can you know now wife the real state of my purse which i did not think it right to mention as long as you were so mad about dressing up patty to get her married but that's all over now and i am willing to make you acquainted with everything i don't think i am a man likely to lose money even here but devilish sharp they are i promise you and i could no more do single-handed than i could fly it is a great piece of good luck my having tornarino and you will have your part to play too my barnaby for it's plain to see that the first raters the planters and such like from the south who are sporting men and come to new orleans for a few weeks lark won't sit down with the first that comes by not they i saw that plain enough and your post must be to make a large acquaintance and keep up a good appearance and make yourself as popular as you can 
as popular as i can repeated mrs allen barnaby with a long deep breath that seemed necessary to relieve the overpowering fulness of her heart what shall you say major allen barnaby if i have already been put upon a scent and devised a scheme that shall not only ensure our popularity but bring us in lots of dollars besides what should you say to that why i should say that my barnaby was a jewel replied the major with an eager expression of satisfaction which showed him by no means disposed to doubt her boasted discovery for to say truth he had really great confidence in the excellence of her understanding which he had for many years been in the habit of watching and always with increasing admiration but make haste and tell me he added for as you may imagine i am pretty eager to understand you i will be as explicit as possible my dear love replied the lady with a little dignity of manner which very well became her at that moment but you must be patient with me or i shall not have the happiness of making you understand me the thing i am about to propose is so perfectly new to us both that at the first contemplation of it i feel it possible that you may testify more surprise than pleasure more diffidence than hope but hear all i have to say and i think the final result will be different you doubtless observed at table yesterday that very handsome woman mrs beauchamp she is the wife you know of colonel beauchamp and from all i can gather from what has been dropped by mrs carmichael and the other ladies the beauchamps are people of quite first-rate consequence not only here but at washington and new york and charlestown and indeed everywhere well i last night had a great deal of most interesting conversation with her both about europe and america it is quite evident that she is a woman of a very superior mind and her feelings of patriotic love and admiration for her own country are something so sublime that she almost frightened me now it is plain as the sun at noonday donny that it won't do playing the same game here that we did at sydney what i mean is that it won't do for us to be boasting of our high family and connections in the old country for it was easy to see that she despised everything in england even the queen herself just as if it was all so much dirt under her feet but after she made this clear enough for the dullest to understand she told me that nevertheless there was one set among the english that was still very much considered in the united states and that was the authors mrs allen barnaby here paused for a moment in her speech in order to discover either from the looks or words of her husband whether any of those ideas suggested themselves to him which swelled her own heart almost to bursting but no nothing seemed to occur to the major but that he must listen further in order to comprehend what his lady was talking about she slightly sighed and then went on well my dear major mrs beauchamp then proceeded to say that there was a book which might be written by one of the old country which if composed in a proper spirit would make the name of the author as popular throughout the union as that of general lafayette himself and bring in such a flood of wealth to the author as had never before been realized by any literary publication whatever this book must be travels through the united states of america i should have thought there had been enough of these written already said the major coldly that is precisely the reason why another is wanted replied his wife eagerly for mrs beauchamp declares that there has never yet been a single volume written upon the united states that was not crammed with the most abominable lies from beginning to end and as she most justly observes anybody who would come forward to contradict all these wicked and most scandalous falsehoods would be rewarded in the very noblest manner possible first by a great quantity of money and next by the admiration and respect of all the people in the country but how can all this affect us my dear demanded the provoking major with the most innocent air in the world i do assure you wife that my writing a book is a thing altogether out of the question i am quite certain that i have no capacity for it but i on my part am by no means prepared to say so much for myself major allen barnaby returned his wife with some little asperity on the contrary you must excuse whatever appearance of presumption you may possibly find in it but i must in justice to myself declare that i feel conscious of the power and the talent necessary to the undertaking you will not i trust oppose it oppose it no certainly my dear i shall not oppose it why should i it can do neither of us any harm at any rate you have my free leave to begin your book whenever you like and i am sure i heartily wish you success with it 
although the major pronounced this speech in a manner somewhat too jocose for the matter of it his wife took it in very good part declaring herself perfectly satisfied and declaring also that she should lose no time in beginning her interesting and very important task i shall of course she added greatly want some competent person to assist me with the information on many points wherein it will be impossible for me immediately to obtain it myself but what i hope and trust to is that i shall be able to form a close intimacy with that charming woman mrs beauchamp and you my dearest major must help me to obtain this object i know nobody in the world so capable of putting a thing in a good light as you are when you have a mind to do it you know what i mean my dear donny a little embellishment and the least bit in the world of invention will make everything easy to me all i want you to do is just to say to mrs beauchamp in your clever easy way that i have been rather celebrated in my own country as an author but that hitherto from modesty i have always published under a feigned name and then you know if you like it you may just hint at any one particular author you please saying enough to put her upon the scent but without committing yourself by absolutely pronouncing any particular name yes certainly i could do that answered the major if you thought it would do any good good trust me donny it would do all the good in the world and if you will only help me so far you shall see that i know how to help myself too i'll take care major not to disgrace whatever you may take it into your head to say of me very well my dear then you have only to tell me in what direction my hints are to go i shall not like to begin till i am quite sure of putting you and your side saddle upon the right horse who of all the lady riders would you best like to be taken for mrs allen barnaby mused for a moment or two before she replied and then said mrs hemmings i am afraid is dead isn't she yes my dear she is said the major and miss austin what's become of miss austin i am afraid she is dead too my barnaby said he dear me how provoking returned the lady but it does not signify there are lots more let us see there is miss edgeworth but you know my dear she has never been married how should we manage about patty it will be downright scandal to make out that our patty is a child of an unmarried lady said the conscientious major allen barnaby then i don't care a straw who it is returned his wife you must make out i am somebody famous and that will do very well my dear i really think i do understand you now perfectly and you are such a devilish clever woman that i dare say somehow or other you will make the scheme answer i'll do my best at any rate to help you but hark there is the thundering breakfast bell now watch me and see if i don't set about my part of the job without losing time chapter x the major displays his conversational talents to great advantage and his success is brilliant a young englishman's motives for crossing the atlantic his principles of justice are explained and the liberal philosophy of fair examination shown in its true light at ten o'clock or thereabouts the comfortable inmates that is to say the white inmates of mrs carmichael's establishment usually met for breakfast most of them obeyed the summons of the great bell on this occasion simultaneously entering the room almost at the same moment and were proceeding to take their places at the table in the same order as at the dinner of yesterday when major allen barnaby with that sort of easy good humour which all lands find it so difficult to resist turned from the place he had before occupied beside his lady and dropping into the chair next mrs beauchamp said it is too cruel ladies and gentlemen to condemn a poor englishman who has crossed the atlantic expressly for the purpose of making acquaintance with persons whose national character he considers as the first in the world it will be much too cruel if you insist upon all our party sitting together so that we can speak to none other shall i be forgiven if i break through the established order of things and begging mr washington tomkins to take my seat beside mrs allen barnaby venture to place myself next the lady of colonel beauchamp it is probable by the smile and the bow which were exchanged as this was said between the colonel and the major that some progress towards acquaintance had been made between them during the rambling of the preceding evening at any rate the overture was well received mrs beauchamp smiled very graciously upon the major as he took his seat and the elegant mr washington tomkins muttered something about vastly happy as he looked full in the face of the beautiful annie and sat down in the chair opposite to her 
major allen barnaby doubtless flattered himself that the chit-chat of a breakfast-table would give him the opportunity he wanted of communicating a little information respecting the high literary reputation of his wife and it is probable that the massive appearance of the viands on the table suggesting the necessity of length of time for their consumption might have made him feel sure of having ample time before him for that purpose but in this he deceived himself altogether beefsteaks of an inch and a half in thickness disappeared it was impossible to guess how with the rapidity of an omelette souffle coffee as hot as mrs carmichael could make it was poured down the uninjured throats of the louisianian ladies and gentlemen with the impunity of cooling sherbet and enormous platters of scalding hot bread vanished with a celerity that really suggested the idea of magic in short every american lady and gentleman had breakfasted and very sufficiently before major allen barnaby had done more towards leading the conversation to the point he aimed at than saying that he hoped mrs allen barnaby would be fortunate enough to make an acquaintance of some intimacy with the lady he had the happiness of addressing as it was highly essential to the particular object she had in view that she should know and be known to the most distinguished persons in the union mrs beauchamp seemed by no means displeased at this she bowed and she smiled but before it was possible she could speak all the gentlemen of the party rose and all the ladies immediately followed their example and rose after them the breakfast was over and the heavily laden table cleared major allen barnaby was startled but not defeated he spoke of the luxury of mrs carmichael's large cool saloon and said he hoped the ladies did not entirely forsake it in the mornings why it isn't very often i expect that you'll find american ladies there major unless they are just quite literary people who give up everything for the sake of conversing with the gentlemen about books i don't calculate that except these you'll often find american ladies out of their own chambers in a morning anywhere then i trust that you and your charming daughter are altogether devoted to literature he replied you will indeed in that case find a most suitable and truly congenial companion in mrs allen barnaby she has never yet published anything under her own name but here all the party having begun to move off mrs beauchamp felt obliged to move off too which the major perceiving again expressed his hope that she and her daughter who had now taken her arm were going to the saloon well i don't care if i do take a spell in the keeping-room this morning she replied her curiosity being in truth as vividly awakened as major allen barnaby himself could desire by the words he had spoken they therefore moved on together and the balcony with its fine orange trees being now in perfect shade the attentive major led the way into it and was presently happy enough to find himself seated on a bench with the charming mrs beauchamp as yet he immediately resumed mrs allen barnaby has never published any work with her own name but entre nous and as a very great secret i will whisper in your ear that she does not mean always to go on in that way and in fact for i see no reason why i should not confess it to a lady so evidently of superior mind as you are in fact my dear mrs beauchamp our chief object in now visiting your glorious country is to give her an opportunity of writing her remarks upon it you have no idea how admirable her style is and in just appreciation of character i will venture to say that she has no equal if she succeeds in this undertaking as i fully hope and expect she will do i have told her plainly that i will not permit her any longer to conceal her name you must not think me a tyrant my dear mrs beauchamp because i speak thus authoritatively but like all persons of genius mrs allen barnaby appreciates her own talents with a degree of modesty that is absolutely absurd and really in my opinion it has become a duty for the sake of her daughter and the noble spanish family with whom we have been so happy as to ally ourselves that a fame so richly earned should not be thrown away upon a supposititious name do you not agree with me do you not think i am right indeed and indeed i do sir replied the greatly excited mrs beauchamp but may i just ask the favour of your telling me under what name your lady has hitherto published major allen barnaby looked in the lady's handsome face with a very intelligent smile and raising his forefinger to the side of his nose said there are some things my dear mrs beauchamp that i dare not do but i will tell you one thing for your satisfaction that if you shall be induced to bestow as much of your valuable friendship upon my admirable wife as i am inclined to flatter myself you will do i will venture to say that you will not be long before you discover her secret her manner of thinking her manner of speaking will be sure to betray her 
and i will not deny that i shall be heartily glad of it for in this distinguished country at any rate she will then enjoy the possession of the fame which she had so wantonly sported with and i may say thrown away in europe yes mrs beauchamp though i know she would quarrel with me for saying so i really shall be delighted if you find her out and so i guess shall i be too returned mrs beauchamp with great animation oh it would be first-rate delightful to turn round some day smack upon her and call her by her false name i shall enjoy it to be sure and you must not refuse major to give me a little token now and then if you see i am in the right way and cry burn as the children do when they are playing hide and seek as much as i can venture to do so without getting into a scrape i certainly will he replied for depend upon it i shall enjoy the joke as much as you will and may i then hope my dear madam that now you are aware what mrs allen barnaby's object is in coming to this country you will extend a helping hand to her and by giving her the assistance of native information without which it is absolutely impossible that such a work can be satisfactorily produced enable her at once to do justice to her own talents and to the magnificent subject she has undertaken there is nothing in all creation sir that i should so much like to do eagerly returned mrs beauchamp all the women in the union the white women of course i mean are counted good patriots indeed they are pretty considerable famous for it but i expect you won't light upon one from maine to georgia as out tops me in that respect and what my mind has undergone in the way of rage at all the horrible scandalous lying books as have been spit out by the envy of the old country against us is a great deal more than i will choose to describe but it is quite droll to think what i said to your lady last evening major why she must have thought i was a witch to be sure what did you say to her madam demanded he with every appearance of eager curiosity what then said mrs beauchamp she never mentioned to you she never told you that i had been talking exactly of such a book as what you have now been speaking of and saying what an outrageous beautiful success it was sure to have in the union if it was but written with decent attention to truth and such a conformity to the merits of the country as the indwellers in it who everybody must allow are the only proper judges would be likely to approve did not your lady say anything about this major no not a word he replied dear me how very odd not the least odd in the world my dear lady he replied as you would be ready to allow did you know mrs allen barnaby better she has so much delicate reserve about her on every point at all relative to her literary pursuits that i am persuaded nothing could have prevailed upon her to touch upon the subject My how unaccountably remarkable that a lady of such first-rate smart talents should be so uncommon shy about it but it seems to me sir as if what you was so kind as to mention just now could never come to pass i mean as regarding any use i might be of about making her take a right view of things how will she ever be able to abide my telling her that i know what she is about demanded the anxious female patriot your question my dear mrs beauchamp enables me while i reply to it to give you another characteristic trait of my admirable wife you must forgive my calling her so the fact is that exactly in proportion as she avoids all allusion to her own great literary success with all who are incapable of assisting her efforts she sedulously cultivates every possible opportunity of entering into discussion with those whom she imagines can give her any species of information on the themes about which she is engaged doubt not therefore that if you will have the excessive kindness to give her the advantage of your knowledge of the country and its inhabitants she will not only enter with you on the subject with the most open-hearted frankness but will listen to every word that you utter with equal respect and gratitude and thus my dearest lady you will be the means of at length sending into the world such a work upon the united states of america as may safely be depended on as authentic then i wish i may be flogged like a nigger if i don't devote myself to the business body and soul replied mrs beauchamp her whole countenance kindling with patriotic energy mrs allen barnaby has nothing to do but just to say when she wants me and i'll be ready to give up all the frolics in creation rather than not be ready to go to her yes major 
please heaven the stars and the stripes shall have justice done to them at last let your lady only do as you say and mind me and all that i have got to tell her and if her book don't prove to her worth a precious deal more than its weight in gold then say that i am a false-hearted woman and send me to the penitentiary major allen barnaby felt that if he talked all day he could add nothing to the impression he had already made he therefore rose and took a most respectful leave saying that he should immediately announce to his fortunate wife the happiness that awaited her while this conversation had been going on at one end of the long balcony a tete-a-tete equally exclusive was proceeding at the other annie beauchamp who had taken her mother's arm as they left the breakfast-room retained it till they reached the balcony but there she dropped it because mrs beauchamp walked towards a seat which had no orange tree in full flower near it and therefore the young lady turned her steps the other way and seated herself where one of those fragrant shrubs was in the greatest malaprop perfection perhaps major allen barnaby's being at her mother's side might have made this movement rather more decided than it would have been without it for annie too was a patriot and though a kind-hearted and sweet-tempered girl in other respects certainly nourished ay and carefully nourished too a pretty considerable strong prejudice and dislike not only to the whole english nation in general but to each and all of the unfortunate individuals from that country with whom she had ever made acquaintance in fact if a stranger were presented to her it was enough for annie to know that he was an englishman in order to set all her faculties to work in order to read him backwards if such a one enchanted by her very uncommon beauty inadvertently permitted his eye to rest for a moment on her lovely face he was the most ill-bred and impertinent of men did an english traveller venture to mention any beauty either of nature or of art that he had left behind him she would exclaim to her neighbour only listen to him can you conceive anything more absurd and insufferable instead of employing his time in examining our glorious and unequalled country there he sits you see talking of his own poor paltry miserable little atom of an island as it is if her beautiful eyes beheld a tall englishman he looked like the mast of a ship if a short one encountered the same doubtful blessing he was a caricature of tom thumb if gracious and graceful as the apollo she was convinced he must be a dancing master and if his conversation betrayed any traces of learning she would exclaim to her nearest friend oh for mercy's sake take me out of hearing of that odious schoolmaster i am as certain as that i live that he comes from one of those hateful abysses of superstition and slavery that they call oxford and cambridge the very sight of him makes me ill such being the state of her feelings it was not very surprising that she preferred her favourite orange tree to being seated near major allen barnaby but if annie's chief motive for the preference was simply getting out of the way of an englishman she was unlucky for scarcely had she placed herself at her ease with a little tabouret for her pretty feet and a cushion for her elbow to rest upon than mr egerton not only an englishman but a cantab to boot had the audacity to approach her now to say the truth mr egerton notwithstanding talents of a very high order excellent principles and a heart replete with a multitude of amiable qualities was fully as much under the influence of prejudice as annie beauchamp herself in common with a multitude of young englishmen whose ripening faculties during the last ten years have enabled them to look on upon the perilous political drama which has been performing with clear judgment and views unobscured by early preconceptions of any kind mr egerton in common with a vast majority of these sages of his own age felt too deep-rooted a reverence for the monarchical institutions of his own country to tolerate the antagonist principles so loudly vaunted throughout the united states of america moreover he was deeply convinced of the political as well as of the religious necessity of an established faith for the perfect working of the social contract which binds men together under one government moreover again the system of slavery was abhorrent to every feeling and faculty of his head heart and soul moreover again he was greatly disposed to misdoubt the honesty public and individual of any country where bankruptcy public and individual was a matter of constant recurrence and constant indifference moreover again he exceedingly disliked listening to the human voice when it came to him through the nose of the speaker and finally approved no dialect of english but that which was held to be the standard language of his native land 
with all these so strong against the deed it may seem strange that the young man after having well nigh satiated himself with travel through pretty nearly every country in europe should have taken it into his head to cross the atlantic in order to visit the land he did not love instead of enjoying the noble fortune and beautiful residence which he had inherited in that which he did but the wisest and best among us have their whims and this expedition of egerton's must i suppose be reckoned among them the immediately propelling cause however of his setting off arose at a dinner-party where he met with a pretty considerably famous american author who not content with entertaining the company by a good set speech of half an hour long in praise of the glorious and immortal institutions of his own country slavery and all concluded it not being in one of his best humours that day on account of an english duke having entered the dining-room before him by rather a savage attack on the inglorious and perishable ones of this mr egerton ventured to make an observation or two on the opposite side but the american celebrity cut him short by saying i beg your pardon sir if i can't count your opinion as any way suitable to stand against mine and my reason is this you have seen only one of the two countries you are comparing together and i have seen both and i leave it to any man to say which has the best right to be listened to i submit sir to the force of your argument replied egerton you must have it your own way but he left not the dinner-table without making a resolution that however great the bore might be he would steam to new york as early as possible and not steam back again till he had visited every state in the union perhaps there might have been some little irritation of feeling in the mood which dictated this resolve but he had pledged the promise to himself in earnest and would not have revoked it even had his afterthoughts led to still greater repugnance as to the keeping it than they did at any rate i shall see niagara said he there is an overwhelming force of consolation in that so mr egerton set forth and had already very nearly performed his destined task at the time of our meeting him at new orleans excepting the person of miss beauchamp which with a degree of candour of which he really felt proud he acknowledged to himself was by far the loveliest he had ever seen in any land and perhaps excepting also her dress the capricious sort of plainness of which rather piqued his taste to the acknowledgment that no garment more meretricious ever so well became a female form with these two exceptions made mr egerton was by no means disposed to think that miss beauchamp was in any degree better suited to his taste than the rest of her countrywomen he had dined twice in her company and his attention had been particularly drawn to her by the uncommon beauty which scarcely a child could have passed by unheeded but he had thought her manner exceedingly defective there was no amenity no tranquil grace no smoothness in it whatever she said seemed spoken fearlessly as if from very perfect indifference as to whether she might give thereby pleasure or not and then her voice though nature had really given her organs which should have rendered it a very sweet one had something in its intonation which grated as it were against his feelings it could hardly be called a nasal voice but yet there was a sort of singing cadence in it which drew off the attention at least of stranger ears so constituted as those of frederick egerton from what she said to her manner of saying it and he was perfectly ready to call the flexible young voice detestable yet for all that he was ready to acknowledge that he had hitherto not seen quite enough of her to judge her fairly and he gravely determined that he would not be unjust no not even on a point of so absolutely no importance as whether a trumpery american girl were a little more or a little less disagreeable in conformity with this high principled resolve he had sought to converse with her on more occasions than one but hitherto with very little success and upon seeing her accompany her mother into the balcony while nearly all the rest of the company were scattering themselves elsewhere he followed her for the purpose of advancing his philosophical study of this peculiar specimen of the race he had crossed the atlantic to scrutinize End of chapters nine and ten chapter eleven of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven mutual dislike arises between the english frederick egerton and the american annie beauchamp the gentleman's disgust leads him to decide upon leaving the country immediately the vulgar but expressive old phrase there is no love lost between them might have been applied with the most perfect correctness to miss annie beauchamp and mr frederick egerton but they wore their dislike such as it was with a difference the gentleman as we have seen being rather persevering in his purpose of knowing more of the young lady 
while the young lady it left to herself would have been perfectly well contented had she been assured that she should never see the young gentleman again nor did this difference arise from the fact on his part that he was ready to acknowledge her the most beautiful person he had ever seen for on hers she was equally ready to acknowledge that he was by many degrees the handsomest person she had ever seen and at the centre of both hearts there was the thought but oh so perfectly american and but oh so perfectly english the difference therefore arose from temper annie was less speculative than mr egerton at least when her mind was so completely made up on a subject as she felt it to be on the present occasion and mr egerton was more disposed to analyse even though conscious that he already knew what the result must be i suppose this is about the coolest place in new orleans miss beauchamp said egerton venturing to seat himself on the farthest extremity of the long wooden sort of sofa which the young lady occupied i dare say there may be a great many much cooler for those who know anything about the place strangers never know where to look for anything returned miss annie beauchamp without condescending to turn her eyes towards him your observation is in contradiction to the remark generally made upon travellers miss beauchamp it has been often said that we almost all of us know more of the countries we visit than the natives themselves for travellers you know make it their especial business to find out everything while those who remain at home find only what happens to come in their way annie drew her beautiful lips together for a moment as if she did not intend to make any reply but upon second thoughts she said i believe that would be perfectly true particularly if speaking of english travellers provided the word disagreeable were added to the word thing what an odious girl mentally exclaimed the young man and with such profound ignorance too what on earth does she know of english travellers and then he cast a glance towards her and took in at that glance certainly without intending it such a face such a form and such an attitude as are only exhibited on the earth at intervals to show what a woman may be when no earthly accidents have arisen to injure the original intention of heaven it is rather an old observation that beauty will have its effect but it is not the less true for its antiquity and frederick egerton at that moment if he did not quite forgive her felt more disposed to hear her speak again than he had ever done before have you travelled much yourself miss beauchamp said he in a very gentle accent and not at all as if he were angry alas no she replied without any caustic accent either as if regardless that it was only a detestable englishman who asked the question but it was one that touched feelings with which his nation had nothing to do and she forgot herself you have not however lost much time as yet if you love travelling what is there to prevent your enjoying it oh there is nothing in the world i expect to prevent my enjoying it except our not being able to set out but if i can't make it convene to travel in a coach i'll travel in a wagon and if that won't do i'll just get along on foot for living as we do in the finest country in the world it's a first-rate sin not to see it all over then you have no inclination to go beyond your own country you do not wish to travel in europe annie looked up at him for a moment and it was a very saucy glance which shot from her sparkling eye as she did so she seemed on the eve of saying something very particularly anti-european but she restrained it and only turned aside her head and laughed i should like to know what you are laughing at said egerton quite determined upon not condescending to be angry with anything so exceedingly ignorant and silly as the opinions of miss annie beauchamp and at the same time feeling it quite fair to make her talk that he might have the twofold amusement of looking at and quizzing her pray tell me he continued what there is laughable in the idea of travelling beyond the united states the joke lies she answered after a moment's consideration in the notion of any one's wanting to see that musty fusty little bit of the old world which you call europe when they may remain to explore the opening glories of this bright young world which we call america and that too with the proud privilege of being one of its citizens poor little fool thought egerton what a pity that such eyes as those should have nothing better to inspire their wonderful expression than the fables of a handful of crack-brained conceited republicans yet still he wished her to say more and therefore resumed the conversation with great civility do you mean miss beauchamp that after having become well acquainted with the land of your birth you shall feel no curiosity to see any other particularly that for instance whence the first white inhabitants of your own highly approved land derived their origin there was something in the wording of this speech that seemed to irritate the young american 
she did not look either as if she meant not to answer it but she paused a moment or two as if to select words for the purpose curiosity shall i have any curiosity to visit the tombs of my vastly respectable great-grandfathers why upon my word sir if no better reward can be proposed to me for the trouble and fatigue of crossing the atlantic than seeing the crumbling relics of a thoroughly worn-out race i really think it would be a great deal wiser to stay at home mr egerton now smiled a little to himself upon perceiving which the colour of the beautiful annie mounted to her temples and the glance she gave him certainly amounted to a flash of indignation this was hardly fair he had borne her laugh more patiently however he thought it was very amusing to look at her in all her various moods and thinking perhaps that he should not greatly mind it even if she boxed his ears he looked as grave as he could and replied of course you have studied as an elementary part of your education the present state of the mother country relatively to the rest of europe or rather to the rest of the world i believe the comprehensive plan of american female education considers this study as absolutely indispensable yes sir she very gravely replied it does and i do assure you that all of our studies it is this which most awakens in our hearts that most excellent gift of pity and those gentle feelings of commiseration which christian teachers consider it one of their first duties to create and cultivate we are quite aware that the noble race of men which now peoples the broad surface of the united states must have derived their origin from a stock possessing the materials of greatness and we look back upon this race with such moderate feelings of affectionate interest as a rational man experiences for the dust of his great-great-great-grandfather but as we know that it pleased the almighty mover of nations to cause the estimable remnant of the community to forsake the falling country when they perceived that it was become unworthy of them and to seek refuge here our affections naturally and rationally fix themselves upon the brave transatlantic portion of the race not only because they are the fathers of the people to whom we belong but also because the very reason for the original separation as well as for the immortal secondary one proves beyond the reach of any question on the subject that they are worthy of all reverence and affection and that those they left are not though they are indeed and ever will be while they are permitted to retain their political existence at all the objects of very sincere compassion upon my word miss beauchamp we are or ought to be excessively obliged to you returned egerton not knowing whether he felt most surprised or provoked by the young lady's grandiloquent harangue permit me to return thanks he added rising and making her a low bow for the testimony you have been pleased to exhibit of your benevolence towards the english nation poor people murmured annie casting her eyes down with a sort of pitying dejection and at the same time heaving a deep sigh egerton puzzled and plagued by the strange form the young lady's patriotism had now taken looked at her with as much curiosity as admiration while she continued to retain her whimsically plaintive attitude but when she furtively raised her eyes again there was an expression in them which made him shrewdly suspect she was only amusing herself at his expense and that it was malice towards him rather than the love she boasted for her country which had inspired her if this were the case he felt that the little republican had the advantage of him and as the idea crossed his mind it was doubtful whether he was more piqued or provoked the former feeling prompted him to continue the conversation in the hope of being able to use weapons of somewhat the same nature in his defence while the latter suggested the wisdom of leaving the very absurd young lady to herself but while he yet doubted the question was decided for him by major allen barnaby's bowing himself off a ceremony which was immediately followed by mrs beauchamp's advancing towards them and saying come annie my daughter i want you in my chamber i have got one or two jobs that i expect you must do for me and besides i have got something to say to you thus summoned annie gave one rapid wicked glance at the countenance of the young englishman and with a slight parting bow retired egerton replaced himself on the bench and fell into a fit of musing she is insufferable he muttered i cannot endure her a movement of impatience caused him to rise again and pace the long balcony of which luckily for his irritated feelings he had the sole possession with slow and discontented sounding strides i hate the country he ejaculated half aloud i hate and detest it from one end to the other the negroes and indians are the only interesting part of the population and the only thing approaching to civilized society that i have enjoyed since i landed was at the german village at 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 heaven knows where 
would to heaven that this self-inflicted penance were over i must steam up that nasty muddy mississippi or i break faith with myself which i never will do at every house i could enter half a dozen miss annie beauchamps in it and a pretty company they would make well enough to be sure to the eye but able to sting a man to death with their odious tongues to-day is wednesday steamboats i believe go every day thursday that's to-morrow i wish to heaven i could go to-morrow but that i cannot do because i have promised the priggish mr horatio timpsackle to go to the french play with him but i must speak about my linen from the laundress for saturday i will positively not stay in this detestable house a single moment longer than saturday and having thus soothed his irritation he stalked through the saloon into the hall and out of the house having encountered a negress in the way to whom he gave strict orders that his linen should be in his room ready for packing by friday night this sort of notable thoughtfulness having been taught him by necessity in consequence of his having for the first time in his life since he left college set off upon a journey without a servant a piece of self-denial to which he was advised by one who knew by experience the effect of the united states upon an english domestic mrs beauchamp and her daughter meanwhile mounted the stairs and having reached one of the apartments sacred to their own use the elder lady closed the door of it and making the fair annie sit down near it began to address her as follows i have something to tell you my dear child that will i expect go straight right away to your feelings as it did to mine i know how you have been brought up my daughter and it is all out and out impossibility that you should not have all your high patriotic notions set blazing by what i am going to tell you annie listened very attentively but had she spoken the truth and the whole truth concerning what was passing at her heart she would have said no more patriotism just now dear mamma if you please because i have been working so hard at it that i am right down tired but of course she said nothing of the kind and mrs beauchamp went on you know only too well my dear child how shamefully the united states have been abused vilified and belittled by all the travellers who have ever set foot in them for the purpose of writing books about us i don't say too much do i annie when i declare that this has positively amounted to a regular national calamity and i'll give any one leave to judge what it must be to the feelings of a free people who know themselves to be the finest nation in the world to have one atrocious unprincipled monster after another come and write volumes upon volumes in order to persuade the rest of the world that we are less behindhand with everybody instead of being as we really are first and foremost of the whole world doesn't it drive one mad annie it drives one into very great anger mamma replied her daughter with something like a sigh well then my darling what will you say to my first-rate unaccountable good luck when i tell you that i have been just applied to by the most gentlemanlike european to my fancy that ever put foot in the states to assist with my information my feelings and my opinions in composing a work the express object of which is to do justice at last to the union and who mamma is the author you are to assist my dear it is the lady the most striking and distinguished in appearance of the new party that came to the house yesterday she looks like a woman of a very commanding intellect and her husband has told me that she has been a most admired author for years in her own country only that she is of too retired a character ever to have put her name to any of her works is it that enormously tall and stout woman mamma demanded annie yes my dear it is the lady who is the stoutest of the party it is mrs allen barnaby i should not have fancied her a particularly shy person said annie gently i must insist upon it child returned mrs beauchamp with a great deal of energy that you do not permit yourself to take up any absurd prejudices against this lady who i positively declare seems sent by heaven to do us justice and remember if you please my daughter how very little you know about the higher classes of people in england depend upon it that whatever you see in her which strikes you as being out of the common way is just the greatest proof of her rank and fashion 
you heard what she said yesterday about going to court and though as a citizen of a free country i thought it my duty to put in my say against courts altogether and all such like abuses of the human intellect nevertheless i am not such a fool as to be ignorant that none but the very highest classes of all are ever permitted to come with inside the walls that hold the queen and though i hate and despise all such tyranny it is quite right in such a case as this to remember all we do know of their abominable old-fashioned ways in order that we may understand a little what we are about which is the way you know to avoid disagreeable blunders i am sure nobody will suspect me such a thorough-going patriot as i am for being likely to have any over great respect for queens and princes and such like and i dare say annie you heard the considerable sharp set-down i gave her yesterday on that very subject but for all that i know what i know and it is something i can tell you in the way of good luck when one is getting a little close and familiar with an english family to find that they have been at court in course our first feeling ought to be suspicion about everybody that is english and it is very convenient by times to get at the whole truth about people don't you think so my dear yes mamma replied annie rather absently for indeed she was not thinking of what her mother had said having been occupied during nearly the whole time they had been together in endeavouring to recollect all she had said to mr egerton and was rather tormenting herself with the fear that she had not been sufficiently caustic and severe in her manner of treating him luckily for the harmony of the dialogue for mrs beauchamp liked to be attended to this indifference on the part of the young lady was not remarked and her mother still in the highest good humour went on to explain a project she had conceived by which every part of mrs allen barnaby's important work might be benefited by her information and superintendence and now my dear said she i must make you acquainted with what i propose to do and it is a great satisfaction my daughter for me to know that it is just exactly the very thing you will like best you know annie how often you have been at father and me about taking you to travel up and down a little that you might see and know something of the glories of the union over and beyond what all my teaching could make you understand well my dear and you know too that i have always promised that travel you should to washington and to niagara and one after the other to all the atlantic cities if we could make it convene with father's will and pleasure but up to this day annie i have never been able to get anything better from him than just off and on sort of promises and his reason for putting it off so everlasting was that though he loved you and i too a deal better than his eyes and i am quite availed that he speaks no more than the truth when he says it yet that for the soul of him he can't make up his mind to travel hither and yon as he says we want to do till we get east of sunrise without a man companion for him to speak to and that's why for he keeps us at boarding everlasting which we two don't over much approbate either of us but just observe how the matter stands now these smart clever people and a large party of em too with two men you see are actually going right ahead to make the tour of the union and the major the authoress lady's husband loves a quiet game of piquet father says as well as he does himself and that he found out last night when they started off together you know after dinner now it does seem to me annie that nothing ever did convene so perfect as this here's the lady come on purpose to write a book on the union but honestly confessing that she don't know the name of one state from another and in course still less about all the remarkabilities of our glorious and immortal constitution and other requirements for such a business whether about ourselves or our works well then there's me ready and willing to supply all she wants and though i say it that shouldn't no ways badly qualified for that same business either seeing that ever since i was a girl at college i have been always celebrated for my patriotism and had a heart in my bosom ready to fight for the stripes and the stars if such a thing was wanted as father has told me scores of times then next comes father himself 
wanting and wishing of all things in creation to please his darling annie by taking her a-touring but never having the heart to set out on account of having nobody in the evenings to take a cigar and a hand of cards with him so then to answer to that comes the major as ready to do both as the sun to rise in the morning and then next there's your darling beautiful self my daughter having your own heart's wish at last and setting out on your travels for everlasting stop you who can now what do you think of all this annie isn't it a pretty considerable piece of good fortune daughter say annie had changed colour more than once during the progress of her mother's harangue not a word of which escaped her for the absent fit was quite gone had mrs beauchamp been less completely occupied by her own share in the proposed arrangement it is probable that she would have perceived that annie's sensations in hearing them detailed were not of unmixed satisfaction but partly because she was too intent upon all she had in her head to see very clearly what was before her eyes and partly because she felt so very certain of her daughter's delight at the scheme that she would scarcely have believed her in earnest had she objected to it she perceived not these latent symptoms of dissatisfaction and exclaimed even before she answered i knew you would be in raptures annie let it pass and only smiled which she certainly did the more easily because a portion at least of the information she had received was decidedly agreeable though she thought that if she had had the ordering of the scheme things might have convened more perfectly to her satisfaction than they did at present her objections however whatever they were she kept to herself and when she spoke at last it was to say that she was very glad indeed that she was going to see something more of the glorious and unrivalled country to which she had the honour of belonging than merely big gang bank charlestown new orleans and natchez you are quite right annie quite and entirely right replied her mother i have been a great traveller in my day a very great traveller and from my high connections in different states have always been among people of the very first standing and to my mind she added no young lady's education can be complete till she has pretty well seen the union through however my dear we have no great cause to complain of father either as yet for we must remember that you won't be seventeen till fall and so there is no great time lost but there is one thing annie that in a small way troubles me and i will tell you what it is my daughter because i have a notion that you might give us a little help if you'll be clever enough to do what i wish what is it mamma said annie with one of her beautiful smiles i am ready to do anything to please you that's a jam girl and this is it then those two elderly-looking women you know that have come along with this celebrated authoress mrs ellen barnaby i can't help having a fancy that they must be people of great consequence because they are both of them so unaccountably ugly and stupid that i don't see the likelihood of any christian soul taking the trouble of bringing them out all this eternity of a voyage if they were not or at any rate they must be somebody that this new friend of mine mrs allen barnaby must think a good deal of and of course would not like to have slighted and the truth is annie that as i know i shall have enough to do to fully enlighten the mind of the writing lady about the union i don't look forward at all i can tell you to having any time to bestow upon them and as to your father his hatred to ugly old women is so great that i expect nothing in creation would make him consent to my scheme except just the pleasing you and having his game of piquet from sundown to bedtime without having the trouble of trotting out to look for a playfellow which i calculate he abominates further than most things this being the way the case lies darling what i want of you is that you would be just a little conversable and genteel in your attentions to these two poor queer old souls will you dear as your share and payment for all the beautiful miles you are going to travel will you annie say certainly mamma if i am to travel with these english people i will endeavour to be as civil to them as i can but i expect they will find me very dull company for it is rarely that i find much that i should like to say to any strangers and especially to english but don't think i object dear mamma whenever i can find anything to say it shall always be said to them oh but annie you must be very civil to the major and to his lady into the bargain and also to the splendid-looking young lady their daughter 
and to the foreign gentleman their son-in-law or else mercy on me we shall be getting into a terrible scrape i guess and have madame barnaby saying in her book that whatever the rest of the country may be the young ladies are the most disagreeable and least elegant people throughout the union don't do anything to get that said annie mamma i will do my very best to please you replied her daughter very gravely but there is one thing that i will not promise because in my heart i don't believe it is one that i could ever perform i cannot promise you to speak very often to the married young lady the daughter mrs beauchamp frowned and shook her head i see by your looks annie said she that you are getting into one of your obstinate fits when you will pretend to know what people are better than your mother does which of all impossibilities is the most impossible and you a girl under seventeen now don't annie don't there's a fine girl don't vex me just when i am trying to do my very best to serve my dear persecuted country and to please you into the bargain it is very cruel of you annie very and poor mrs beauchamp looked very much as if she were going to cry but her beautiful daughter ran to her and drove away every indication of the kind by a kiss trust me mamma she said i have promised you that i will do the best i can and so i will shall i go this very minute and find out these miss perkinses that is the name i expect isn't it mamma shall i go to them now wherever they are and ask them if they will take a walk in the balcony i am sure it must be cooler than the room they have got poor things for cleopatra told me that our sly lump of soft solder mrs carmichael had persuaded them to lodge themselves in a little hole of a garret looking exactly west that she might keep a decent room vacant in case any of her regular new orleans beaux as she calls them should offer themselves i will go to them directly shall i yes do darling and i will go too and see if i can find my new friend mrs ellen barnaby pray mamma said annie rising to depart have you said anything to papa yet about your travelling scheme no my dear i have not replied her mother with a smile but that is only because i have had no opportunity i don't fear any opposition annie there you know pretty nearly as well as i do dearie that if i take care that the piquet and the toddy go right nothing else is likely to go wrong annie knew that as far as the word wrong meant opposition her mother had the best possible grounds namely that furnished by many years experience for her confidence in having her own way so she said no more but walked off shaking her head however rather mournfully as she went for though she loved her mother she loved her father too and often regretted that his habitual indolence which seemed to have absorbed everything like activity in his character had permitted him to lay himself so completely on the shelf End of chapter 11